Linda Yu, and it's my pleasure to host this discussion about the science and economics of longevity with Professor Andrew Scott, an economist at London Business School, and Professor David Sinclair, a geneticist at Harvard Medical School. It is an absolutely fascinating area of research, but before we get into your research, your findings, your recommendations, just tell me, how did you first start working together. What brought an economist and a geneticist together? Sounds like a bad joke, doesn't it? <laughs> really bad joke. I don't, I'm trying to remember that. I think, I mean, I think um, I was trying to recall this, actually, how we actually started working together. I think, you know, David's got this extraordinary scientific research and he's trying to get people to take notice of it in government. And one way to do that is to put economic numbers on things. And certainly it's interesting, my background as an economist with fiscal and monetary policy, get into the area of aging and longevity, and then turning around to say, well, who do I talk to to make a difference? And recognizing actually most of the sort of big economic institutions aren't thinking of this issue. So I think that's why we got together. And it's certainly a lot of fun. Uh, I'm certainly learning an awful lot with, uh, from David. Um, yeah. David, you got any memories? Uh, I don't know. It feels like we've known each other forever, so I don't. Yeah. I don't remember. But I, but I had I have this a similar uh, situation where in my field, so I'm a, I'm a biologist, but I think like Andrew about the future of the planet, and in most talks that I give, people ask me, well, what's going to happen if what you're saying actually becomes an eventuality? And so I, I've been wanting to work on the economics of, impact of what I do, and uh, I was looking for a world leader in this and. Of course, Andrew is that person. So it's been very exciting to team up with him. Well, I think your combination is, uh, what is that saying? The sum of the parts uh, is, uh, it's greater than if you were just to add it up together. So I certainly found that reading your work. So, so you mentioned, David, there that um, you wanted to have an impact. So just tell me the reaction you get when you talk about these issues to the wider public. Um, or reaction from businesses, governments, and then Andrew's in question to you in a moment. Yeah, well, Linda, it's changed a lot. When I first started in this field, going back oh, now 25 years ago, uh, it, it was pretty rare that people took it seriously. There were very few scientists working on this topic of aging, and there wasn't a strong discussion or any serious discussion in the public, at least, about working on aging. It was disease and disability, and death, and then there was aging. Uh, but that's changed a lot. We've really come a long way, thanks in part to Andrew's book, I think, that we now, as you know, a, a populous, world populous, uh, UK, America, Australia, many countries are really interested in, first of all, understanding why we age. Second of all, figuring out how to extend the period of youth in life, so extending our health span, and then I think just as importantly, what the impact would be on our lives and also on the world's economy and on the planet if these things, actually it's more of a, a when these things that we're working on actually become an eventuality. I just feel like there is a shift. I mean, Andrew, obviously you've written um, terrific books on this, which um, are absolutely a must read. And I think indeed David's right. I think it's helped shift interest, the 100 year life, the new long life. So what reaction do you get? Andrew, when you're yeah, well, presenting course, I, this you know, now. I, come, I come at things from a different angle. I mean, David's got this sort of jaw-dropping scientific results and insights, uh, which are sort of just staggering. And then, you know, I was doing coming more in terms of what people are doing. Um, mm. And, you know, it was it, very interesting. I think 2016, the 100 year life came out. And, you know, clearly it's, it echoed with people. I think people realized that they were behaving and aging differently and they needed to behave differently. Um, and that was the response from individuals, readers, etc. It was a little bit harder getting governments and corporates interested, but that's certainly beginning to change the last few years. You know, governments, less the economic side, but governments are suddenly recognizing, oh, wow, actually there's a, there's a different thing happening here. It's not just about old age and illness. There's also possibilities and options. Mm -hmm. And how do we seize that? And, you know, for instance, the UK, uh, you know, how do we focus an economy after Brexit? What's one of the strengths of the UK, the life sciences around the world, everyone getting older, there's this big global market. So there's beginnings, I think, of, uh, of interest, but certainly amongst the broader public, uh, you know, it's 
I would say it's one of these big mega trends is the most personal one. There's loads of big trends that are going to shape our future and the environment clearly being one of them. But ageing will as well and how we as a society adapt to it. But of course, it's also the most personal one because we all know that we are ageing and we're concerned about our future. So as a macroeconomist, it's always to me been a, a, an easy one to get individuals to think about because they think about their own future. Mm. So are there more se some sectors or countries which are more responsive than others, Andrew? Well, I, it's, it's, that's a good question. So I think everyone's a little bit behind where they should be. Uh, mm. uh, but Singapore is really focused on healthy ageing and healthy longevity. And, you know, I think I always say there's two things happening around the world at the moment in terms of population. One is because of falling birth rates, you've got more old people. And then the other is people living for longer. And the balance of those two is different in different countries. But if you look at Japan, China and Singapore, the fall in the birth rates is really dramatic. So they do have a lot of older people. So it's incredibly important that they age well. I'm sure that's why Singapore is you know, seeing you know, a fertility rate, I think it's about 1.1 at the moment Singapore has. It says, wow, we've really got to age well. Elsewhere, it's uh, uh, a bit more scattered. I, I don't know, perhaps uh, David's got the insights from the US and Australia. Yeah, the US and Australia are pretty similar. I would throw UK in there as well, where politicians are open to it, uh, but not really acting on it just yet. The regulatory authorities are open to it, not acting. But uh, yeah, Singapore's leading the way. The other country that I've been really impressed by uh, is the UAE. Um, the Emirates are really pushing forward with a lot of technology and genetics and wearable devices and uh, the vaccines, they were way ahead of any other country I know. So that they're also very much into keeping their populace uh, healthier for longer um, and looking at both the science of longevity and the economics. And I, I think it's very smart. And, and the first country to do this, I think, will become the envy of the rest of the world and others will follow suit. Mm. It's a great segue into your joint paper um, that um, could help countries and sectors um, embrace this and be at the forefront and doing some things that are just talking about it. It's a paper on the economic value of targeting aging. So, um, Andrew, tell me about this paper. That's a dangerous question, Linda. Um, <laughs> I have for a long while about paper. So it's a paper uh, with David and Martin Ellison from Oxford. And, uh, and I was um, at Harvard to, talking to David and David was sort of keen to get some numbers attached to so you know it's, it's clear when you say you know look at the potential of this that you almost don't need numbers if you can age healthily and live for longer and have better health we know that's valuable but of course when it comes to government there's always trade-offs and there's concerns about costs so you know we said yeah. okay how can we go about putting the value on this and as an economist i'm kind of interested in two ways of answering that question one is what are the implications for gdp and i think that's a really big question and it involves all sorts of things that kind of economists just have to look at. Because um, once you start looking at living longer and healthier for longer, you do everything differently. Like the 100 year life says, you can get education different, you can do skills differently. And there's lots of assumptions you need to build to understand the true GDP implications. And actually economics tends not to look at longevity, it looks at aging. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that's a work in progress. But there's a whole set of tools in economics, that, in health economics, that you can use to put a monetary value on improvements in health under certain assumptions. So that's what we said we'd look at. How can we put a dollar value on various interventions that would make life longer, make life healthier, would even slow down or even reverse aging? So that's what we wanted to try and answer. Um, and I, I'm a great fan of the paper because it's, it's kind of got everything. It's got science, it's got economics, it's got literary references, but also it's got big numbers and a result that is both surprising and obvious. So, uh, you know, that's what we were trying to work out. So, you know, one thing we looked at was, you know, there's a, we know that people are living longer, but they're getting more years of ill health. So is it, is it still valuable to extend life? And the answer is yes. But obviously as health diminishes as you live for longer, the gains get smaller and smaller. So the other thing we looked at was what are the gains to not making us live longer, but just to get healthy life expectancy to catch up with life expectancy. So a compression of morbidity we call it. And that's incredibly valuable. Another year of healthy life is just incredibly valuable. And what we found was actually making sure that your health matches your lifespan 
is more valuable than further increases in the lifespan that don't change your health. Now, you know, you know, it's nice to put numbers on those things, but perhaps that's not surprising. But then we started looking at things that might slow down aging, slow down the onset of all these age-related diseases that tend to happen in later life. And then you get some interesting results because what you find, not just the numbers are big, but they're bigger than either just increasing health or life. But also they don't diminish because there's this lovely trade-off between health and life expectancy. The healthier you are in old age, the more you value further increases in life expectancy. And the longer you live, the more you want to increase health. So there's this sort of nice interaction and balance between them. Uh, so we started to sort of explore some of those and then we moved on a little bit more to look at, uh, 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 there's a metformin as a drug is uh, of great interest as potentially having uh, effects on re reducing the incidence of age-related diseases. So we started to play around with some of the results from trials with that, or studies on that. And you get these huge numbers, you get these really, really big numbers. And it's, there's a whole bunch of different factors that lead to really, really large values. The first is that as you get older, you value slowing down aging more and more. And it kind of makes sense, partly because it's kind of happened to you sooner, but also you're more likely to get into old age. So, you really, so as societies age, we really value these treatments focused on age-related diseases. Secondly, there's that sort of spillover between healthy health life expectancy and life expectancy that increases the value of each of them so that the longer you live, the healthier you want to be and, and, and vice versa. But of course, if you can slow down aging, you impact a number of diseases. So that aggregates across lots of things. But then the other thing that's really important is that you know it's really valuable to try and slow down the incidence of cancer, but there's still other diseases that will be that you'll be vulnerable to. Whereas if you can slow down all age-related diseases, the quality of life is huge. So it's not just aggregating across lots of them. The sum is greater than the, 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 the individual parts. So there's all these different spillovers. And then the sort of the final big result, the final big virtuous circle one was really interesting, which is that. You know, really, what you see from all this, this is the natural next stage of health. You know, we, we tackled infant mortality, we tackled midlife. Now we're focusing on the diseases of older age. But what's interesting is that we found that the better you get at aging, the more you value further improvements in aging, which is really interesting because normally with a disease, if you sort of can tackle diseases that get you in your 40s and 50s, you're then interested in diseases that hit you in your 50s and 60s. What we found with aging is the better you get at aging, the more you value further improvements in aging. So there's like a virtuous circle and all the effects I've talked about are behind that. There's also something else, which of course is you have more people living into old age in better health. So there's just more people around as well. So what you see is simply a, you know, a result that just says the most important new health imperative, given how long everyone is now living, is to age well. That's about the whole life course, not just the end of life. And the better we get at aging, the more we're gonna to want to age even better. So if we can be healthy into our 80s, then we're gonna to want to be healthy into our 90s, et cetera. So you just sort of see this focus of medical research going more and more that should be into tackling these age-related diseases. And the numbers are staggering. Yeah. I mean, we, we sort of come up, I think with $37 trillion is for you know, a one-year increase in life expectancy through slowing aging for the US economy. These are staggering numbers in terms of how valuable they are, because given the mortality rate and the disease profile, the most important thing now is to age well. And that's not just for old people, it's for everyone. Yeah, mm. yeah I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, just looking at the numbers that you've attached to the various different, um, you know, uh, I'm going to describe them as literary scenarios because Andrew, you mentioned you you somehow managed you all the two of you managed to write with Martin a paper that refers to Gulliver's Travels, Dorian Gray, Peter Pan, and this is my favorite X Men: The Wolverine. <laughs> so I want to get into uh, some of these uh, details, but first, um, David, can you uh, just say a bit more about? Uh, metaphor so it's metformin the potential impact of it so what you know what is uh, metformin and is it a wonder drug well the the big picture is that uh scientists over the last 20 years have figured out that we have these inbuilt mechanisms to delay aging there are what we call longevity genes and they protect us against 
the nine major causes of aging, which we call the hallmarks of aging. And these are typically things that uh, we hear about in, in the news uh, occasionally, the loss of mitochondrial function. So these are the power packs of the cell, uh, loss of stem cells, loss of the ability to respond to nutrients, uh, proteins misfolding, that there's a long list actually. Uh, and so what these longevity genes do is that they, they actually, that the, they're not normally active in our modern life, unfortunately. Us sitting around and eating constantly is the worst thing for us. Uh, and so that's why diet and exercise for a start is, is, is the way to go. That turns on these longevity gene defenses. Now, there are a few uh, molecules that have, well, lots actually, hundreds of molecules that have been found to extend the lifespan of simple um, and dozens of, of, of mammals, including mice and, and some dogs. And metformin is one of just a handful of drugs that are already available on the market for treating a disease. Uh, the other famous one is called rapamycin, which is uh, less safe than metformin, but nevertheless is, is pretty potent for lifespan extension. But getting to metformin, the reason metformin is exciting is uh, for a few reasons. One is that it activates the pathways that I was just talking about, these longevity defenses. Uh, the ones we work on and I talk about in my book are called sirtuins. And there are a, a few other family members, uh, but it's not really that complicated. As long as we turn on our body's defenses, it seems that we can live longer and healthier. Now this drug metformin is, was discovered oh, way back in the 20th century and the 60s, I believe. Uh, it became more popular in the 70s and has now been in millions of people as the first line of defense against type two diabetes, which is high blood sugar in the elderly, typically in the elderly. Um, and if you're obese and you don't exercise, you're predisposed to type two diabetes, um, which of course will uh, age you more rapidly uh, and shorten your lifespan. So at a minimum metformin will help prevent and actually treat that disease and bring down your blood sugar levels, hopefully. And it's a relatively safe drug as far as drugs go. It's on the list of, um, essential med medicines for humanity. I think that's the World Health Organization's definition. And what it does is it, uh, it does many things, this drug. Um, it uh, originally comes from, uh, what is it? The, the French lilac. Uh, it's now, it's modified to be longer lasting in the body, but it's, it's essentially a natural molecule uh, that one of the things it does is it interferes with the mitochondria that make the energy in the cells and tricks the cells into thinking that they don't have enough energy and so they, they ramp up their energy production. And this also helps turn on the longevity genes, which also get tricked into thinking there's adversity and perhaps some starvation going on. And so the outcome of that seems to be that cells are more resistant to diseases uh, and deterioration over time. And epidemiologically, in studies that have looked at tens of thousands of people, typically in the US uh, veterans, there's a statistically significant effect, not just on the diminution of type two diabetes, but also lessening of uh, predisposition to other diseases, which includes heart disease, frailty, and cancer. Uh, and so that's a big deal if it's true. It means that a simple drug, it's relatively simple, it's just one molecule, it's cheap, it probably costs to make it a cent per pill, a few cents, uh, and available globally. Uh, it's very exciting that there could be something already that could be prescribed, not just for type 2 diabetes, but to slow down aging as well. That's absolutely fascinating. And in the paper, you focus on this shift in disease burden towards chronic non-communicable diseases, which in 2016, the United States, and this is a staggering figure, 72.3% of deaths were caused by such um, diseases. So you write in the paper that focusing on age-related diseases is a natural next step for medicine. So um, it'd be great, David, if you could say a bit uh, more about that. And I'm still thinking about the longevity gene, by the way. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I'm sure. So what, what really is we're talking about here is in part classifying and regarding aging as a treatable disease. That is what really is going on in, in some of the countries that we talked about. Once you do that, it means that doctors would be much more comfortable prescribing a drug like metformin before you get type two diabetes and before you get 
the typical manifestations of aging. And that we, Andrew and I and, and others believe that is really the best way uh, to address healthcare. It's the biggest bang for the buck, as we've shown in this paper, for a very cheap uh, you know, few, few cents a day. And what really, if you think about it, the majority of uh, age-related diseases are uh, not caused by smoking, not so much caused by a bad diet. It's caused by aging. Uh, and we've far too long neglected that fact. But uh, finally, I think uh, many people in the world, thanks to Andrew's book and perhaps uh, some people who've read mine, are understanding that you can't just address diseases alone. You need to get at the root cause of these diseases, which is aging itself. In other words, the processes that lead our body to become frail and less able to fight against the ravages of time. Mm. Um, Andrew, um, it's a nice uh, lead-in for you to, uh, to share with us the main findings of this joint work. So which treatments are the most valuable and what are the implications for healthcare? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as David said, there's this cluster of diseases all which have aging as one of the biggest underlying factors. Uh, now, you know, David will know more about whether it's the same pathways of aging and whether they're multiple ones. But you know, what the paper shows is the, the, the benefits to delaying aging, slowing the incidence of these diseases. They're just huge. And you know, there's different ways of looking at it. So David can talk about the, the likelihood of and the progress that science has made. But you know, these are enormous numbers, 37 trillion for one year gain in health. Uh, 30, uh, we, 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 once, we once nearly got to a quarter, quarter a half of a quadrillion in terms of a 10 year gains, which I was very excited about because in the Economist, I'm often using the word trillion, but rarely a quadrillion. So these are staggering gains, <laughs> reflecting, of course, the fact that in high income countries, most people today will live into their 80s and 90s. And if you can make them healthier for longer, those gains are enormous. Um, so, you know, I would say the following, which is that if you look at the allocation of health research right now, very little goes into studying aging as an underlying phenomena. We're focusing mm -hmm. on single diseases. And when you get a number like 370 trillion for the gains in the US, even if you multiply it by a small probability of success, you get a very, very big number. Now, you know, David can talk more about whether it's a smaller or a large probability of success, but that's really the, the, the heart of the model. And it's a, just a very natural next stage of medicine you're always gonna, as a society, focus on the disease burden that causes the biggest problem given the age structure of society. And when you know, a large proportion of children would die in the first five years of life, clearly a massive value in tackling diseases and illnesses that drive infant mortality. And thankfully we've done phenomenal progress in that. I was staggered the other day, I was looking at the UK numbers because the year I was born, 1965, the most common age of death was less than one in 1965. And that's kind of a little bit personal because I was an identical twin and my twin died in that first year. But wow, and then you know, before COVID, I don't think it's changed that much because of COVID, the most common age of death in the UK is 89, which just sort of shows you where sort of that, that heavy focus might be. Now, the second most common age of death when I was born was 79. So, you know, it's still, uh, it's a little bit dramatic that um, zero number. But you know, medicine will always focus on the diseases that cause the biggest health burden. And it's clear right now that is in these cluster of age-related diseases. And it's striking even during COVID that these age-related diseases will be the main, these non-communicable diseases still account for the majority of uh, deaths and disease. And of course, with COVID, what we've seen is that the mortality risk in COVID mimics all causes of mortality very closely. So if we got if another uh, alarm bell going in the economy that actually with lots of older people you can't have a healthy economy unless you've got a healthy population so targeting these age-related diseases is absolutely the next uh, the health challenge for me I think what's interesting if I step back from the science and the health is of course it's not just about treatments and drugs it's also about exercise diet activity purpose education all of which we know can help how we age and so if I think about the size of the economy devoted to health, it's always has got bigger. I think it's likely to carry on getting bigger, but it'll be increasingly focused on 
making sure we age well. One of the early working titles of the paper was All's Well That Ages Well. And I think that's absolutely the summary now. For the first time ever, children born in high income countries today live to be, you know, a high chance of living to 80s and 90s. Therefore, the most important thing is to age well. And that's what, really what the paper tries to establish. Mm -hmm. I think it does it very well. There's just so many things we could cover off. Um, so David, I'm going to um, ask you one of the things that you say, which is aging is easier to treat than cancer. So how is that possible? Yeah, well, so aging is uh, governed by these inbuilt pathways that we have. Uh, we share these with yeast and little round worms and flies and mice, of course. Uh, and we don't even need to understand what causes aging to be able to treat it. We can tap into those. Um, we also just published a paper in Nature a few months ago where we just put three genes into a mouse and reversed the age of its tissues. We focused on the eye and restored, uh, you know, reverse blindness, restored their eyesight. It's, it's yeah. extraordinary. I mean, that just, just, I mean, I can't kind of believe you. I mean, in the paper, we have the Wolverine example, which is regeneration. And yeah. that's what David's talking about. It's staggering. It's not even slowing down aging. It's literally reversing. Yeah, Sorry, it, David, I just find it. Oh, it's, thanks, it, it, it really, it, we have the ability now to turn back the clock. We, first of all, we can measure the body's clock. I could take Linda, I could take your blood sample and, or a cheek swab and tell you pretty accurately within about 5% of your biological age, not your chronological age, and then predict when you go to die. But because we have these tools now to measure aging accurately and the age of your body, or a mouse's body in this case, uh, we could actually measure and prove that we reverse the age of, of that mouse's eye by about 70%. Uh, and then these tissues come back to life like they were young again. But the point is that that wasn't very difficult. Once you know how to do it, uh, you know, similar to Columbus, you know, once someone shows you how to do it, it's a matter of just sailing in that direction. And this, this, you know, any student could do this. In fact, a high school student now could use these three genes to rejuvenate um, if they wanted to, probably their pet dog or pet cat's not that hard once you know what you're doing. So that's why I say aging is going to be easier to treat uh, than cancer, which is many different diseases. Uh, cancer, there's hundreds of different types with probably thousands of different mutations that cause it. Whereas aging is relatively simple. What we've learned from these experiments that we just published is that there's a backup copy of youthfulness in the body that you can tap into and reset the system. There's that information. It's akin to polishing a scratched DVD and getting the movie or the music to play again. It's that simple. Um. Uh, for those who are watching and don't remember DVDs, little discs, you <laughs> pop in, <laughs> you hit play <laughs> before the age of streaming. <laughs> before I turn to Andrew and uh, more of the economic implications, David, what is more likely, delaying aging or reversing aging? Well, I, I think in the short term, we're going to be able to delay aging. Metformin is already a, a potential solution to that. And there are many drugs in development that do that. There are drugs that eliminate the zombie cells. We call these senescent cells in the body. Those are in development. Uh, there are ones that have little, uh, little proteins that you can inject into the blood that have rejuvenation qualities. Uh, and there's, there's really a long list, uh, mitochondrial boosters, uh, NAD boosters is what I work on. These are, these are chemicals that raise a chemical that declines during aging that activates the body's defenses. So slowing aging, I think, is, is in the cards. Uh, someone's going to get a drug on the market probably in the next five years, hopefully sooner. We hope to treat a, a person in the next couple of years to hopefully restore their eyesight. Glaucoma patients would be one group that we could treat. But ultimately, where I think age reversal is heading is that we can reverse the age of, of any tissue. And ultimately, if we look forward maybe 15, 20 years, rejuvenating the entire body and then just repeating it every decade or so. Wow. Okay, so Andrew, what are the economic implications here in terms of employment, GDP, national output, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So, I mean, obviously there's lots of scenarios to consider here and it all depends whether it happens quickly or slowly. And is it gonna be, you know, it, it, it's interesting, you, you, we talk about reversing aging uh, and that sort of just 
blows the mind. But you know, David's talking about taking a glaucoma patient and getting them to see. Uh, and you know, that's you know that, that that's not quite as wild as sort of the notion of just completely reversing aging. So lots of scenarios. But here's my take on all this. Very sort of simply put, um, you know, we need to seize a longevity dividend. We're living longer lives. And there needs to be three dimensions to that. So longer lives, I think, should be a good thing. But of course, we need health to keep up with it. So we need to have healthy aging. But we also need to make sure that the economy and we're productive during those times. Uh, but if we're living for longer and we're healthier for longer and we're productive for longer, all this should be good news for the economy. Uh, you know, it's interesting there's that negativity around an aging society story. There's more old people, they don't work, uh, healthcare costs, pension costs. And, you know, well, I can sort of see that. First of all, I think that's to turn a great achievement into a negative one. But on average, we are already living longer and healthier for longer. Mm. We're just going to make sure that we continue to do so. So all this should be good news for the economy. But it's going to require an awful lot of change. We're already, you know, one of the big challenges we've got at the moment is from age 50 onwards, people start to withdraw from the labour market. And some of that is about ill health, because not everyone is healthy for longer. Uh, but uh, some of it is caring for uh, elderly parents, uh, which again, yeah, ageing healthier can do something about. But also some of it's just ageism. Firms see older workers as not productive. And how do we tackle those challenges? So to make sure we can be healthier for longer is part of it. But also how we then plan our life and of course that takes us right back to the hundred year life story with more future you have to invest more in that future you have to invest in your health your finances your skills your relationships and your purpose but all of this should be good for gdp i find it very hard to think about it in any other way but it will of course change how we think about what we do at each age uh, and how we behave so it's sort of opening up a new stage of life for us to then determine how we use the extra time and the extra health to support hopefully a better life. Mm. So Andrew, a very practical question. Can we afford the drugs? Well, again, it's an interesting one. So we afford all sorts of drugs right now. Uh, and, you know, if there's this GDP benefit, they should potentially pay for themselves. From our paper, you know, the one we talked about economic value targeting aging, the gains are so big that even if the drugs are expensive, it's actually worth having them, even if it means we're sort of worse off in other aspects of life. Um, but clearly what you want to make sure is that these gains are widely available to everyone and at a price that doesn't bankrupt the country. But I don't, we never sort of talk about that problem for other um, uh, interventions around health. So it's not obvious to me why this will necessarily be such a, a, a big problem. And I say, if we can at the same time make sure that we can age better and work for longer. It's the other way to look at it is, can we afford not to have these drugs? Because if you look at the cost of non-community diseases, they're huge, they're, you know, they're several percentage points of GDP. Uh, and the caring burden also means that there's another loss of output that comes from it. So there's, you know, they're valuable in their own right. They should unlock lots of uh, uh, GDP improvements. So I would say, yes, we should be able to afford it. Right, well, you have a few words on that too. So the, these drugs that are, chemically based like metformin, uh, once you make them by the ton, they're not that expensive. They're down to a few cents, maybe a dollar a day. Uh, and you know the, the impact that you get is, is many orders of magnitude greater uh, in the return. Um, there's another revolution that's happening that is becoming democratized, cheaper. This revolution's going on as we speak, and that's the ability to monitor patients very extensively, not just in hospital anymore, but at home. Um, there are devices, actually patches that don't cost much. You stick them on for a couple of weeks and you get motion, uh, you get falls, heart rate, body temperature, a whole range, dozens of measurements actually in real time. And these developments in this the monitoring and ability to react when somebody's going to have a heart attack before it's already happened, for example, or even changes in mood for depression, uh, this will be happening over the next five, 10 years. And that in combination with these cheap molecules that are being developed, I think will dramatically change people's lives for the better and extend people's healthy lifespan. What I find interesting, and you know, why I like talking to David and the scientists involved in this pioneering research is that really what this all is about is the notion that age is malleable. 
that we can improve how we age. And it's kind of interesting because often when I was, you know, started with 100 Year Life and the social science, there were sort of two reactions. One was about social practices and this is what we do. And, you know, and then the other was that you know, age isn't money, but we, but we know it is. We know that how we exercise, what we eat, whether we smoke, how much we drink, all these things influence how we age. So, you know, what's stunning talking to David is they're taking that malleability to a, another level. But again, it's that very natural evolution of mm -hmm. health, which is how do we help the body get past various diseases and infections? And now, of course, we've been so successful in our countries of doing that, that there's this new territory. And clearly there are ways that we can age better without uh, the genes that the development that David talks about. And some of that is about monitoring, but some of that also is about practice and behavior. And for me, what's sort of interesting is we've never had so many people living into these years. And so we've never really actually put much focus on them. So there's an awful lot to learn actually about just best practice, let alone frontier science about how we can improve. And all of it comes down to that category of healthy aging. And in a sense, as the paper says, when everyone born in rich countries has such a high chance of living into old age, that becomes what the health system should be focused on. Mm. It's, an, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I want to wrap up with some thoughts from both of you on what you think the first practical applications from your work will be um, and how you see it progressing. David first. Well, this paper, I hope, stimulates a global discussion, uh, not just among scientists and economists, but, um, well, I guess economists are scientists too, sorry, Andrew, but, um, <laughs> the, uh, but no, I mean, if politicians, regulators really need to look at these numbers and crunch them for their own country and realize the, the huge dividends that they'll get uh, in their nation if they start paying attention and investing in this area. I think, by the way, okay. if, I, if I live to 100, I still won't end the conversation about whether economics is a science or not. So uh, <laughs> I will push that to one side. Um, so uh, for, for me as an economist, uh, there's two things I think are really, really important. The first is to seize the advantage of the gains that have already happened. And you were talking about prospective gains, but already we are living longer and healthier for longer. And making sure that we can feed that into the economy, particularly focusing on employment for people aged over 50, is super important. Then the other thing I think is interesting is how do we fund the development of uh, the treatments and the research that David's talking about, but also you know, a huge number of consumer products and consumer activities, all of which will support healthier aging. There's a lot of talk about a silver economy, meeting the needs of older people, but you know, if it all is well that ages well, that's not just about supporting the needs of older people, it's about ensuring everyone ages well. So that's a huge new part of the economy that technically is around health, this sector. So I think it's just raising awareness of that, both in governments and corporates, it's really important. Mm. I think that's a brilliant note to, uh, to end on. There's so much more we could um, discuss, but it's an absolutely fascinating area of work. And I'm still, well, I'm blown away by a lot of it, but um, a couple of things that I'm gonna take away from this is one, we have a longevity gene, and two, a slowdown in aging. And this is your statistic, Andrew, that you mentioned before, that increases life expectancy by just one year is worth just under $40 trillion, just for the United States. I mean, the gains from this area are just absolutely staggering. So thanks very much to Andrew Scott and David Sinclair for an absolutely stimulating uh, discussion. And I look forward to seeing your work making substantial differences and impact around the world. So thank you uh, for this discussion and thank you for the work. Thank you.